One man towers over 20th century sci-fi more than any other. You might be expecting me to say Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, or Isaac Asimov, at least those of you who clicked on this without looking at the title. But I'm talking about the man who discovered them, or propelled their careers to superstardom. I am talking about the editor who was THE editor of Golden Age science fiction, John W. Campbell. John W. Campbell saved science fiction. John W. Campbell remade science fiction. John W. Campbell ruined science fiction. All of these are true statements. So who was John W. Campbell? He started out as one of the eager young authors who grew up in the pulp era. By 18, he was published in Hugo Gernsback's Amazing Stories, the magazine that he would eventually push out of business. And by 21, he was writing so much that he managed to flunk out of MIT. He picked up his degree at Duke the following year, but by this point, it was clear that he was going to use his physics degree to improve his writing, not have his writing supported by his physics degree. For years, he wrote space adventures similar to what was common in the pulps in those days. But when he was 24, he adopted a pseudonym and began writing a different kind of story. A headier story. A more grounded one. He started to develop a philosophy around what science fiction could be, culminating in perhaps his greatest piece, Who Goes There? Or, as you may better know it, the story that The Thing was based off of. By the time he was 21, Astounding Stories hired him to act as editor, and it was at this point that his writing dried up. He stopped publishing his own works and threw himself into editing because he had a vision, an idea of what science fiction could be. In the words of Isaac Asimov, by his own example and by his instruction and by his undeviating and persisting insistence, he forced first Astounding and then all of science fiction into his mold. He abandoned the earlier orientation of the field. He demolished the stock characters who had filled it, eradicated the penny-dreadful plots, extirpated the Sunday supplement science. In a phrase, he blotted out the purple of pulp. Instead, he demanded that science fiction writers understand science and understand people, a hard requirement that many of the established writers of the 1930s could not meet. Campbell did not compromise because of that. Those who could not meet his requirements could not sell to him, and the carnage was as great as it had been in Hollywood a decade before, while silent movies had given way to the talkies. And this is true. Campbell almost single-handedly wrenched out of the genre all of the elements that made people dismiss science fiction as juvenile. With the collapse of amazing stories, there was basically only one place around to publish science fiction, Campbell's Astounding Stories, and he would be damned if non-Campbell stories were getting in there. The hacks were out. There was a new type of idea-driven story that was coming in, and with it, a new type of author. And Campbell didn't just edit his author's works, he trained them. He had rules and dictums for how he thought science fiction should be written that he taught to his new crop of minds that he was developing. Rather than get lost trying to show the audience how cool spaceships or computers or ray guns would be, he pushed his authors to make those things seem mundane. Because if these things seemed ordinary to people in the story, then the whole period the story was set in would seem amazing to a present-day reader. He wanted stories that used science but that weren't about science. And he really wanted stories that had a central idea that you could summarize in a sentence or two but spend pages exploring. In fact, he was famous for throwing such ideas at his authors, telling them to write me a story about a man who will die in 24 hours unless he can answer this question, how do you know you're sane? Or, write me a story about a creature that thinks as well as a man, but not like a man. He even helped to craft Asimov's laws of robotics. Of course, this love of depth and well-thought-out stories did get him in trouble at times, like in 1944 when he was working with one of his authors on a piece about the possibility of atomic war, and the FBI came knocking because their guesses in the story were a little too good. Hilariously, after convincing them that any well-read person could guess exactly what the US government was doing with its nuclear program, obviously, he convinced them to let him publish the story anyway because pulling it might arouse more suspicion. And, in a final coup de grace, he told them, oh, By the way, you're doing the project in Los Alamos. I can tell, because a surprising number of Astounding Story subscribers have suddenly moved their subscriptions there in the last few years. 
Through the 30s and the 40s, his unrelenting attitude, coupled with a genuine philosophy of what science fiction should be, really did usher in what we would now refer to as the golden age of science fiction, whose authors we're going to be talking about for many episodes to come. But by the 50s, the cracks in Campbell's dictatorial editing style began to show. He alienated many of the authors he once trained, still trying to impose his will on writers who had, frankly, outgrown him. He became enamored of pseudoscience, defending ideas about psionic powers and wildly unscientific anti-gravity devices. He also became a loud and vocal proponent of an idea that one of his authors had brought him. It was a piece by one L. Ron Hubbard called Dianetics, A New Science of the Mind. Yes, indeed, it was Campbell who published the first piece on Scientology, and he bought into it completely. His tenure at Amazing Stories, which by this point had been renamed to Analog Magazine, had one last great work in it, for it was the first place that you could ever read Dune. But the great flaws in Campbell's dictums for sci-fi and in him as a person were starting to become clear. While he had wrenched science fiction out of the hacky pulps and made the world acknowledge that it wasn't just a juvenile fad, his iron grip on the genre had propelled it into another form of stagnation. The Golden Age left us with square-jawed men doing practical things in a practical universe. It wasn't as much about characters as it was ideas, and the characters it did have were mostly those of the American ideal that Campbell so admired. Stoic men making hard decisions, or demure women, there to support their stoic, hard-decision-making men. Also, Campbell was a racist, and there is just no reason to sugarcoat it. It doesn't make science fiction as a genre worse, or make any of us bad people for enjoying it. But I think it's important that we do accept that reality. Perhaps the most important editor in the history of sci-fi wrote editorials defending slavery as one of the most prevalent forms of human interaction in history, and stating that the United States would have been better off not fighting the Civil War because capitalism and industrialization would have eventually made slavery obsolete anyway. He was pro-George Wallace and generally regressive whenever matters of race came up. He was also fairly authoritarian in his views. The ever-outspoken Michael Moorcock, who would eventually lead the charge to move sci-fi away from the Campbellian model, even went so far as to call him a crypto-fascist. And Campbell let his authoritarian streak bleed over into his editorials and the works he published. Campbell's legacy is a complicated one. We usually date the beginning of the golden age of science fiction with the start of his tenure as the editor of Astounding Stories. And as the editor of Astounding Stories, he threw the hacks out of sci-fi and made it something more than it was. As the editor of Astounding Stories, he trained many of the greatest science fiction authors of the 20th century. But he also published a number of reactionary and downright dangerous ideas. He fought against the stagnation of the time, and, in turn, created a new form of stagnation that later authors would have to fight against. But, to the credit of the authors and the genre, even many of those he trained distanced themselves from him as his more extreme views became clear. So join us next time as we delve into the work of one of the most prominent of Campbell's disciples, Isaac Asimov.